All right, welcome. Welcome to Vital Voices. Uh, we're really excited about our presentation today. Uh, I'm John Schwartz. I'm the Dean of the College of Public Service and welcome to everyone in the room and on virtual. Uh, I think we have a great presentation today. Uh, we are the College of Public Service at University of Houston downtown. We are the second largest university in Houston, most diverse, not only in Texas, but in the Southern region. Uh, and we really focus on our programs of criminal justice, education, and social work at our college. And our mission is to really not only train future leaders and future difference makers, but make a difference in the city of Houston while we do it. So that's really our goal. Uh, we are uh, excited, especially about today's presentation, because we have Dr. Kaplow, who uh, Mr. Volano will do an introduction for, who is a world-renowned expert in trauma. And it's such an important issue for every one of our professions uh, and, and what we're trying to, to accomplish. So I'm really excited to have her today and have her as a friend to our college. So I appreciate her. And I'm going to introduce our amazing center director, Mr. Villano, who will introduce Dr. Kaplow. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Schwartz. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for all of those uh, who have logged in online. And obviously, thank you for all of those who are here in person. See, if you were here in person, you'd have pizza. But anyway, um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Kaplow to you. Um, as, as Dean Schwartz said, she is a friend of our college. She has been gracious with her time with us. She's coming back again to give this, uh, this lecture specifically to those in the criminal justice and social work professions. Dr. Kaplow is a licensed clinical psychologist, board certified in clinical child and adolescent psychology. She serves as the executive director of the Trauma and Grief Centers at the Hackett Center for Mental Health in Houston and the Children's Hospital New Orleans. She's also a professor of psychiatry at the Tulane School of Medicine. And in these roles, she oversees the development and evaluation of novel treatment for traumatized and bereaved bereaved youth and disseminates trauma and bereavement informed best practices to community providers nationwide. Dr. Kaplow also serves as the CEO of the Lucerne Center for Trauma and Grief, a group practice, a group practice providing free telepathy, teletherapy services, telepathy, free teletherapy services to youth and families exposed to trauma and loss throughout Texas and Louisiana. Following Hurricane Harvey, Dr. Kaplow and her team provided evidence-based risk screening and interventions to children and families adversely affected by Hurricane Harvey and its aftermath. She also helped to establish the Santa Fe Resiliency Center following the Santa Fe High School shooting, where her clinicians provided evidence-based assessment and treatment to families impacted by the shooting. Dr. Kaplow is a strong proponent of a scientist-practitioner approach. Her primary research interests focus on the behavioral and psychological consequences of childhood trauma and bereavement with an emphasis on therapeutically modifiable factors that can be used to inform interventions. She's published widely on the topics of childhood trauma and grief with over 85 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. She is the lead author of Multidimensional Grief Therapy, co-author of Trauma and Grief Component Therapy for Adolescents, and co-author of Collaborative Treatment of Traumatized Children and Teens, the Trauma Systems Therapy Approach. Prior to joining the Hackett Center, Dr. Kaplow served as Chief of Psychology and Vice Chair for Behavioral Health in the Department of Pediatrics at Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Kaplow received her BA in psychology from the University of Michigan and her PhD in clinical psychology from Duke University. She completed her internship at Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, followed by postdoctoral training at the Center for Medical and Refugee Trauma at Boston Medical Center. Without further ado, it is my privilege and honor to introduce to you Dr. Julie Kaplow. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. I've got like four mics on, so hopefully you can hear me. 
Um, but thank you so much for that very nice introduction, um, Stephen. And and it is true. Um, Stephen and I have known each other for a while now, and have just I've really loved being able to collaborate with him and and work closely with this college. So I'm really thrilled to be here. And today I'm going to be talking about um, what. I think you'll probably agree is a very important and timely topic, which is the silent epidemic of childhood trauma and grief. And the reason I talk about this as a silent epidemic is because we know that in the context of the pandemic, we've heard a lot about long COVID, for example, um, the physical symptoms that can last in the context of the pandemic. But what we haven't heard as much about are the long-term mental health ramifications, particularly for those kids who lose loved ones um, due to COVID. So that's something we're gonna be talking about today. So I wanna start by telling you a little bit about the Trauma and Grief Center and what we do. I'm gonna go over some key definitions, including um, information about a theory called multidimensional grief theory. We're gonna talk about links between bereavement and suicide risk and distinguishing between PTSD and grief and why that's a difference that makes a difference. And then I'm, today, given the audience, what I'd like to do is touch on a few different evidence-based practice elements that have been consistently found to help kids who've experienced trauma or grief, and then touch on the cost of caring, meaning how can we ensure that we are paying close attention to issues like vicarious trauma or secondary traumatic stress among those of us who are helping these, these children and adolescents. So before I get started, I want to just give you a little bit of background about the Trauma and Grief Center. Um, we have two right now, but the one that is local is housed at the Hackett Center for Mental Health in Houston. And we do four different things. So we develop and innovate novel treatments for kids who've experienced trauma or grief ages seven and up. Um, and basically, you know, that, that is really designed to be um, evidence-based assessment and intervention that we develop and disseminate. For With regard to training, we do community-based trainings where we train school and community-based clinicians in the very same practices that we use. We do research looking at the long-term effects of trauma and grief, not just what can happen in terms of negative ramifications, but what are the natural strengths and what, it, what do we see in terms of natural resiliency after something like this. And then policy recommendations. We Now that we know what is best practice in terms of helping kids who've experienced trauma or grief, how can we ensure that all kids across the nation receive that best practice care? I also want to touch on the Lucene Center. Um, so this is, as um, Stephen mentioned, our group practice that is affiliated with the Trauma and Grief Center. We provide free teletherapy to kids throughout Texas and Louisiana using the very same evidence-based assessments and interventions that we have developed. So the Lucene Center and the TAG Center really work hand in hand to ensure that the research is informing the clinical work and that the clinical work helps to inform the research questions that we're asking. So I want to start by talking about trauma, and I know that for many of you this is a little bit of a review, but just to make sure we're on the same page, when we talk about trauma, we're talking about the experience of a real or perceived threat to life or bodily integrity or the life or bodily integrity of a loved one, and that is what causes an overwhelming sense of terror, horror, helplessness, or fear. The key word here is perceived, though, right? So um, what may be traumatic to one child or adolescent may not be traumatic to another. And there are different types of traumas that we can experience. There are acute traumas that we hope will probably only happen once and chronic traumas that can happen over long periods of time. And sadly, in many of our under-resourced communities, these things are going on at once. Kids are experiencing acute traumas and chronic traumas. And we also know that about half of US children will experience at least one trauma over the course of their lives. And for again, for many of our communities, it is much more than one trauma. We also know that recognizing traumatic stress in children and adolescents can be really tricky because post-traumatic stress can look a lot like other psychological issues. So for example, post-traumatic stress can resemble anxiety. Often these kids are worried that something bad might happen to someone else in their family. Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. With post-traumatic stress, kids can become very hypervigilant, so sort of jumpy, and that can look like hyperactivity. 
Or they may be very avoidant, trying really hard not to think about or talk about the traumatic event, which can look like distractibility. Or there could be conduct problems um, that, again, really arise from being triggered in the classroom. So a child may be reminded of something terrible that happened the night before, may all of a sudden be out of his seat, may be acting in an aggressive way. And if the teacher is unaware, that certainly can look like a conduct problem. And then physical illness. We hear this all the time from pediatricians where children may be presenting time and time again with headaches or stomach aches. And if the pediatrician is not necessarily asking the right questions about what might be happening at home, um, that can go on for a long period of time without being recognized as the somatic side of post-traumatic stress. And so please forgive me because I don't normally like to compare children to rats, but in this case, I feel like this is a really interesting experiment that kind of gives us a window into what can happen to kids who are experiencing trauma. So this was a study that was done a while ago in 98 by um, Panksepp, and he studied rat play. And his hypothesis was that when rats were in a calm, continuous state, they'd be able to learn from their environment, They'd be able to absorb new information, and they can even experience joy. But what he also hypothesized is that if rats were in a stressful environment, um, a, an environment that actually was potentially traumatic, that they would not be able to absorb and learn from their environment. And so he did this very interesting experiment where you can see here he measured the rat play for the first four days. And they were playing very nicely, um, very active, and then on day four, he inserted a single cat hair into the rat cage. And you can see here that the cat, that the rat's play dropped to nothing. In fact, they froze in place. And the really interesting part of this, from my perspective, is that on day five, the cat hair was completely removed, so no more cat hair, but the rats never returned to baseline. So he actually followed them for over a month, and the rats never went back to their play. Now, what does this mean for children? Um, so, you know, this is a little bit of a generalization, but we, what we know is that it is true that we are wired to respond to danger and threats to safety. And so imagine a child who is living with the cat or a perpetrator. The perpetrator is removed. We can't necessarily expect that child to just snap back and go back to feeling calm, playing, learning from their environment, absorbing things. What we know is that we have to help to create that sense of safety and security in order to get them to that place where they can feel safe again. And so this leads me to telling you a little bit about um, some qualitative interviews that we did with teachers in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And you'll see that you know, they're seeing the same things that I just described. One of them says, our kids were already acting out before the hurricane, but things got much worse afterwards. Sometimes the whole class feels out of control. This is a second grade teacher. So many of the children seem to have ADHD. They just can't keep still and listen for more than a minute. So of course, this is what it appears to be, right? These kids have behavior problems. They have ADHD. But in reality, that is part of the, the, um, the way they're manifesting their post-traumatic stress. And so what we really need to do with our teachers and our educators is think through, how do we shift that culture from what's wrong with that child to what happened to that child? What might be going on in their environment that is causing them to react in that way? And so we also know that if we don't address these things early on, there can be a number of long-term ramifications. We know that kids who experience chronic trauma can have smaller brain volumes, more depression, more suicide risk, more school problems and problems with peers, substance abuse, violent behavior, delinquent behavior, and even the intergenerational transmission of trauma. And what we know is that the majority of society's most significant problems, including sex trafficking, domestic violence, community violence, often stem from unresolved childhood trauma. So if we can address this early on, if we can identify these kids as quickly as possible, we have a much better chance of helping society as a whole. I also want to turn to a specific form of trauma that we call bereavement, which I'm sure many of you are uh, very familiar with. So bereavement is the experience of deprivation or loss by death, whereas grief is the psychological or behavioral response that arises from bereavement. So in other words, bereavement is to trauma as grief is to PTSD. 
And the reason this is important is because there is a lot of literature out there linking bereavement to future problem outcomes for kids. There are almost no studies looking explicitly at grief. So you would think that it would be very important to think not just about the death itself, but about how that child is reacting to that death that could be predictive. But the reason that we're focused on bereavement and not just trauma is because it is the most frequently reported type of trauma in clinic-referred youth. It's also the most common form of trauma worldwide, and this was even before the pandemic. We now know that there are about 211,000 children who've lost a caregiver due to COVID. It's the most distressing form of trauma among adults and youth in the general population. So if you were to ask anybody, what is the hardest thing that's ever happened to you? The vast majority would say it was the death of my brother, my mother, my sister. It's also the strongest predictor of poor school outcomes above and beyond any other form of trauma. This is a study that was conducted by my former postdoc, Ben Osterhoff, who looked at about 10,000 um, students across the country and found that the sudden death of a loved one was actually the strongest predictor of poor school grades, problems learning, lack of school connectedness, school truancy, above and beyond sexual abuse, physical abuse, witnessing domestic violence. So this is another major area that we're really trying to focus on in terms of helping to educate schools about the importance of paying attention when a child does lose a loved one suddenly, that this is um, something that we really need to be honed in on. We also know that youth of color are at greater, greater risk due to the higher rates of COVID-related and violent deaths. So a recent study that we did showed that black youth actually had higher levels of PTSD and maladaptive grief than white youth. And when we did a deeper dive, we saw that that was because many of them were living in under-resourced communities where violence was the norm and homicide was the norm. Um, so we really, again, want to be paying close attention to those that need us the most. Um, we also know that bereavement occurs at high rates among justice-involved youth. So I'm probably preaching to the choir again to many of you, but most detained youth report the death of a close loved one with 70% experiencing at least two or more significant losses. Detained youth report experiencing their first death on average at a very early age by age five. And most of these deaths are violent. So most of them are homicide. And so the reason we're talking about this is because, you know, not only is it important to be paying attention to bereavement itself, it's also important to be paying attention to the types of deaths they're experiencing and also their reactions to those deaths. So just like with trauma, um, what causes great distress for one child or adolescent may not cause great distress for another. Similarly, there are lots of different ways that children can grieve, and not every child is going to be in need of a psychosocial intervention. Some may be okay with peer support or familial support, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. There are some important facts that I want to touch on about grief, and the first is that most bereaved children will go on to lead healthy, happy, productive lives. So we are in no way pathologizing all grieving children. We know that most of them are actually going to be OK. Um, there is no right or wrong way to grieve. And despite what society tells us, there is no set timeline or expiration date for grief. So there's a little bit of this mistaken notion that kids should be over it after a year, over it. Um, and of course, that's not the case. We know that grief stays with us. So grief is not a problem necessarily to be fixed. It is a natural part of life and a reflection of the love we have for the person who died. So it does not go away. Um, however, it changes over time, right? And so there are moments where we may have setbacks because it reminds us of the person or there are transitions where we wish the person was there. Um, but the grief is there because of the love we had for, for that person. I want to also just touch on this theory of grief that I've had the privilege of working on with a couple of colleagues at UCLA, Chris Lane and Bob Pinus, called multidimensional grief theory. And you know, when you think about or read about a, the adult um, theories of grief, oftentimes you hear about adults having or not having complicated grief or having or not having prolonged grief disorder. But what we're finding with kids in particular is that grief is multidimensional. Can everyone hear me okay? But is that better? Closer? Okay. So grief is multidimensional, meaning that kids can be high or low in separation distress. This is yearning or longing for the person who died. 
They can be high or low in existential or identity distress. This is feeling lost without the person, or what, what am I going to do with my life now that the person is not here? Or circumstance-related distress, being very preoccupied with the way the person died, like I wish I could have intervened, or I wish they hadn't suffered so much. But we also know that within each of these dimensions of grief, there's an adaptive counterpart. So for example, I was working with a young girl who um, had uh, just lost her mother. She was very close with her mom. This was a devastating loss for her. And she really, really missed her mom. And um, the more we worked together, the more we discovered that if she started to engage in the behaviors that she used to do with mom, like make her mom's favorite apple pie or take swim lessons, because that was something her mom loved to do with her, the less disconnected she felt and the more connected to mom she felt in a healthy way. And that would be considered the adaptive side of separation distress, finding those healthy ways of connecting. Existential identity distress, we hear this all the time from adolescents, for example, who say, I don't know how I'm going to get through life without my dad. But we also hear them say things like, I want to live the kind of life my dad would have wanted me to live, or I want to do things that would have made my dad proud of me. That would be the adaptive side of that dimension. And then circumstance-related distress, we also hear this all the time. Actually, one of the most poignant examples is um, I was working with a little boy whose father died in a plane crash. And when I asked him, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, I want to be an engineer so I can make planes that don't break anymore. And we see that kids will naturally gravitate toward wanting to change the circumstances of the death into something that can help other people so they don't have to suffer so much. And in fact, I would say that some of our most important inventions, like exit doors or seat belts or other things, stem from tragic losses and wanting to ensure that that doesn't ha happen to anyone else. And so those adaptive sides of each of these dimensions are what we really try to harness in the treatments that we use. So I'm just going to give you a few examples. These are taken from, um, these are illustrations from one of the interventions that I'll be talking about today called trauma and grief component therapy. But this is a good example of separation distress. This is a boy whose father died, and his mom is saying to him, your dad would want you to enjoy these tickets. Why don't we go to the game together? And he's thinking, I can't ever go back there anymore. It won't ever be the same without him. So we see this all the time where kids will start to avoid doing things that they used to love doing because doing those things without their person there is just too painful for them. Here's another example. This is a girl who was just accepted to her college of choice, and her father, who just died, was her biggest cheerleader. She's thinking, I don't care about my future anymore. If he's not going to be a part of it, he'll never see me graduate anyway, so what's the point? So we see, oftentimes with adolescents in particular, um, giving up on their hopes or dreams or aspirations for the future when the person who was really supporting them the most is no longer there to either continue to support them or to enjoy it with them. And then finally, this is a, an example of circumstance-related distress. This is a girl whose brother died in a gang fight. She's thinking, every time I see his picture, I can't help thinking about the night he got killed. It gets me so mad that it's hard to remember the good times. So she may want to positively reminisce about her brother, but anytime she thinks about him, she's flooded with those very anger-inducing and upsetting thoughts and feelings about how he died, and she just can't hang on to those positive memories. And so why is this framework important? The reason we think it's important is because different dimensions of grief may actually be more prominent at certain developmental stages. So what we see is that young children under the age of 12 often have higher levels of separation distress, whereas adolescents tend to have higher levels of existential or identity distress, which makes sense if you think about the, um, the developmental phase that they're in at each of those age groups. Um, different dimensions of grief may not be present in all bereaved populations. So, for example, we know that kids who are in very um, violent communities often have much higher levels of circumstance-related distress than kids who are not in those communities. And the reason this is important is because the different dimensions require different treatment components. So in other words, a one-size-fits-all treatment for grief is ineffective. And the reason for that is because kids can be high or low on any of those dimensions, and we want to make sure that what we're actually targeting is what they are experiencing and what is going to be the best fit for them.
So I'm going to pause there for just a minute before I launch into links with suicide. But any questions or comments so far? OK. I'm going to take that to mean it's perfectly clear. Um, and I will move on to suicide. So we know that suicide is a major public health concern. It's the second leading cause of death among adolescents. These are figures from before the pandemic. Um, so we know that these figures are higher now. It's also 18% um, of high school students report seriously considering suicide. 9% report an actual suicide attempt in the last year. And we know that adverse life events are often linked to suicide, especially bereavement. So that's what we're going to focus on here. So what we often see in kids who experience the death of a loved one is suicide, um, suicide ideation in the form of reunification fantasies. So this, again, is, a, is an illustration from trauma and grief component therapy. This is a girl whose best friend died, and she's driving recklessly. And she's thinking, it doesn't matter if I live or die. If I crash, the bad news is I'm dead. But the good news is I get to see my friend again. So this can take several forms. It can be a little more passive like this, where they're just engaging in some risk-taking behaviors, not really caring if they live or die. Or they may actually start to have a plan to reunify with the person. And of course, this is completely dependent on their um, on their own spiritual beliefs. So, you know, of course, if if someone does not believe they would be reunited, then um, we would likely not see this. But this is something we need to be paying close attention to because of the frequency at which it's occurring um, and also the fact that it can actually lead to a, an, a suicide attempt. We also know from the interpersonal psychological theory of suicide that there are a couple of risk factors that tend to need to be in place for an adolescent to die by suicide. The first is thwarted belongingness. This is a sense of loneliness and perceived lack of support. Um, and perceived burdensomeness. This is when one has become a drain on the resources of others. In other words, people are better off without me here. And we see this, both of these things, very frequently in bereaved youth. And in fact, we have some direct quotes from um, interviews we've done with bereaved children and adolescents. Nobody understands me. No one knows what this is like. People think I'm weird because I don't have a mom anymore. Or anyone I get close to dies. I shouldn't get close to anyone anymore. So that sense of thwarted belongingness is very prevalent in kids who are bereaved. We also see perceived burdensomeness. Mom starts to cry every time I mention how much I miss dad. In other words, she'd be better off without me. If I had been better behaved in school, mom wouldn't have been so stressed and had a heart attack. So we also see this where kids will create narratives about how they were the cause of the death. And that can lead to that sense of perceived burdensomeness. And we also know that there are several bereavement-related risk factors that have occurred in the context of the pandemic that we need to be aware of. The first is increases in thwarted belongingness, of course, as a result of social distancing. So thankfully, we're you know sort of coming back together. We're moving in the direction of having more social engagement. But certainly, if someone had um, lost a loved one during the pandemic, they have they probably missed out on that ability to receive the needed support, like in the, at the funeral or in the weeks following, and that can be extremely difficult for kids and adults alike. We also see increases in perceived burdensomeness as a result of ongoing pandemic-related stressors. So oftentimes when, um, when a child loses a caregiver, for example, they have to move to a new home. Um, the uh, surviving caregiver may, may have to get a second job. And in the context of the pandemic, that's only been compounded by the fact that many individuals have lost jobs and um, are struggling. And youth may be at higher risk for suicide as a result of the circumstances of the death. And so I want to turn now to distinguishing PTSD from grief. Before I do, I'll just pause for a minute. Any questions or comments about anything I've covered so far? OK. So PTSD and grief, we know, are not the same thing. They have different precipitating factors, meaning that trauma reminders, which are people, places, or things that remind the person of the traumatic event, typically lead to PTSD. Loss reminders, which are people, places, or things that remind the person that their loved one is no longer there, typically segue into grief. They also have different physiological effects. And so often when we're um, describing this difference to parents, for example, we'll talk about 
PTSD as that feeling of um, the last time you felt so scared that you weren't sure whether to run or hide. With grief, it often feels more like, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to stop crying. That's how sad I feel. And so if you imagine what those things feel like in your body and imagine that happening simultaneously in a child or adolescent who has experienced both trauma and grief, we can almost immediately recognize how psychologically and physiologically taxing that can be. They require different assessment tools, so obviously the way we assess for PTSD is different than grief, and they, of course, require different practice elements. In the um, trauma world, there are a number of evidence-based treatments for trauma that sort of lump grief in, right, that it's part of trauma. But what we know, of course, is that they are very different and actually require um, different practices to help with those experiences. And so I want to turn now just briefly to trauma and loss reminders. So again, um, the trauma reminders and loss reminders are similar, but one obviously leads to PTSD, one leads to grief reactions. And so what we really need are treatments that distinguish between trauma and grief. So one such treatment is called trauma and grief component therapy. This is one that we've done a lot of training in across the greater Houston area, but also across the country after different tragedies. So for example, this was used in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, this was used in the aftermath of the Santa Fe school shooting, in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. And the beauty of this treatment is that it can be flexibly tailored. In other words, when we use it in schools, the school counselors can decide what modules make the most sense based on the needs and strengths of their own students. So for example, if they have a number of students where grief is the primary issue, they might, they might choose to do just modules one and three. Or if trauma is the primary issue, they might just do modules one and two and four. Um, so it can be flexibly tailored and it can also be used in groups and also individually. And we know that it's effective based on a number of studies um, that show reductions in PTSD, depression, and maladaptive grief. But the reason that we've gotten a lot of buy-in from school districts is because of the fact that they, we see improved school behavior. So enhanced classroom rule compliance, peer relationships, performance, interest, and then decreases in anxiety and violence. And in fact, we recently did a study just using modules one and three in a juvenile justice setting um, in Cincinnati and found decreases in violent behavior just from using that one module, the grief module. So um, again, it speaks to some of the underlying causes, the root causes of why kids might be engaging in some of those behaviors, especially if they've had significant losses. And one of the other programs I just want to mention here that is probably relevant for many of you in the audience is this idea of how do we identify kids early on to prevent that school to prison pipeline. So early identification is key. We want to identify these kids in the immediate aftermath of a trauma. For so many kids, they go on for years and years without anyone knowing what they've witnessed or what they've experienced. We also want to meet kids where they are, which is often in schools. So often it is the teacher who can speak to how they're behaving on a daily basis. And we also want to enhance communication between law enforcement, schools, and mental health providers. So one of the programs that we're just now launching in Galena Park ISD is called the Handle with Care Program. Some of you may have heard of this. It was started in West Virginia. Um, there is a current Handle with Care Program in San Antonio. But what this does is that um, basically, when a law enforcement officer is at a scene of a crime where a child is present, whether it's a homicide or suicide or domestic violence, that police officer has a streamlined way of letting the school know this is a handle with care child. And at that point, the teacher can then um, monitor that child for a period of two to three months. We train them in what to look for. And if they see any signs or symptoms of PTSD or grief, um, then we can make the appropriate referral. So this is one way of helping both law enforcement and the schools become both trauma and grief informed. So I'm going to pause there. Any questions so far? Yes. 
That's a great question. So can you, can you repeat the sure. question? So um, he was asking about how did we measure the difference in school interest and school performance and, and those types of issues when we did the pre and post trauma and grief component therapy. To be honest with you, I can't remember the exact measure that was used for school interest. I know that we, we um, collapsed the data to look at the child's attendance, their grades, um, other things that the school was actually measuring, so both before and after the treatment. Um, and so we used, we sort of combined that data to really look carefully at, at how that was impacting things. Does that help? No. Well, so, so basically the groups were decided upon based on referrals from school counselors. So, so they were, these were kids that were already struggling. And so they were brought into a group and then we had their pre and post scores on all of those measures. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Hold on a second. I want to make sure that people online can hear the questions back and forth. Sorry. I was just wondering is if these studies are from pre-K all the way to school, all school age children. That's a great question. No. So the trauma and grief component therapy is really designed for kids ages 11 and up. So um, it's really designed with adolescents in mind. Up, yes. So the upper age range, we've used this all the way up to age 23. Thank you. Sure. I, I want to make sure I understood. So the 17-year-old who witnessed her mother um, killed by her dad, so sh uh, she had both. She suffered from both PTSD and grief. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So she had high scores on PTSD as well as high scores on separation distress and circumstance-related distress. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So at, at the juvenile probation department, specifically where a gang case load, we see a uh, increase in revenge shootings and revenge uh, homicides. Is PTSD because these these children who are doing these shootings have experienced their friends, their brother, their cousins getting killed? It, can PTSD explain or can it be an influential factor for the action? That's such a great question. So, you know, it can be PTSD. It can also be grief. So, what we what we've seen with kids in JJ settings is that oftentimes they re-engage in those violent behaviors as you said, either to get revenge because they're still so angry about the circumstances of the death that they want to get revenge on who killed their their person. Um, it can also be PTSD in the sense that we see um, when kids have not fully processed their trauma, we see that reenactment where they will put themselves, not intentionally, but even on a subconscious level, put themselves in situations that are reminiscent of an earlier trauma, almost as if they're trying to master it. Um, and we also see what we call enactment, where kids will actually try to do things they wish they could have done when they were younger. So for example, um, a young eight-year-old who is constantly physically abused by a stepfather um, may then go on to um, beat other people up as an adult because it was something he wanted to have done when he was younger and did not have the power to do. So that is all sort of clustered under the PTSD umbrella. Any other questions? OK. So I want to just touch on the top four practice elements that we see across trauma and grief treatments. The first is emotion identification reg and regulation. For so many kids, they might not even know what it is they are feeling. And so a lot of the work is rooted in, here is what it feels like to have PTSD. Here is what it feels like to be experiencing grief. And we also explain that when your body is fully relaxed, it is nearly impossible for your mind to be stressed. So if they can get their bodies into a calm state, then often the stress and anxiety that they're feeling associated with PTSD can be diminished. So we teach them these deep breathing techniques in order to help them, them with that and to have more tools in their toolbox for when they're experiencing distress related to their trauma. We also know that trauma processing is a big piece of this. So with trauma processing, we want to help them to process the entire situation. So who was there? What happened? When did it happen? Um, where were they? What were they smelling, thinking, feeling, touching? And this is really designed to alleviate their post-traumatic stress, 
and some forms of circumstance related to stress if it's a death. The idea is that if they can process these things in a very calm, supportive environment, the, the trauma itself takes on less power. It doesn't become as scary over time, and they can become more desensitized to that. With grief processing, this is a little bit different. So with grief, grief processing, it's not so much about just the death itself. It's really about the different dimensions of grief. So all about the person who died, what they miss the most, how they can stay connected, um, how the person died is obviously a piece of it, but then where are they now? This is something that so many of our kids grapple with, trying to really understand the spiritual side of things. Um, and obviously, we're not planting any ideas in their head. We're really trying to harness what are the beliefs they have that can be most comforting to them, how things have changed, making meaning of the death, and then how do they get back onto a healthy developmental trajectory? What do they want for themselves in the future? And then finally, parental grief facilitation is a big part of one of the treatments that we've been developing called multidimensional grief therapy. And the idea here is that we know that certain parenting techniques are very helpful in the aftermath of a death. Things like continuing to have routines, positive reinforcement, active listening. But what we've learned over time is that it's not so much about what the parents are saying, it's more about what they're doing. So we actually studied um, caregivers and their children who were, who were bereaved and looked at the way they communicate with each other. And what we found is that it wasn't so much the content of what they were saying, it was the behaviors that the parents displayed. So things like physical affection, smiling, consistent eye contact, being present for them, were all associated with decreases in distress. And so the idea here is we know that for surviving caregivers, this is a really difficult task to bear witness to your child's pain. But if they can do that in a way that shows the child, I am here for you, I'm ready to listen, that is actually the most important thing that we're seeing in terms of helping children after the death of a loved one. And in the last few minutes, I just want to touch on self-care and why this is so important. So we know that there can be a cumulative impact of traumas and losses for all of us, especially those of us in the field who are working with kids and adolescents and young adults who've experienced trauma and loss. And for us, many of us carry past traumas, past losses. Then we have some bad news at work. Then we're in the midst of a pandemic. We have more stress. We stub our toe and we're crying on the floor, right? And part of this is that that accumulation, that cumulative risk can really add up over time. And so we want to be aware of how much we're carrying so that we can um, help both ourselves and others and colleagues that we're seeing who are struggling. We know that there can be various forms of cost of care of the cost of caring. So vicarious trauma and vicarious grief are just what they sound like, experiencing the traumas and the losses that those around you um, have experienced, feeling those feelings. Secondary traumatic stress is when you actually develop symptoms of PTSD based on what you're hearing from people around you. Compassion fatigue and burnout, I'm sure you're familiar with these terms, but this can often happen when we're encountering lots of experiences of vicarious trauma or secondary traumatic stress. And there are some risk factors that have been identified for secondary traumatic stress that include um, women, highly empathic individuals, those with unresolved histories of trauma or loss, heavy caseloads of patients exposed to trauma and loss, socially or, or organizationally isolated, and feeling professionally compromised due to inadequate training. Now, it doesn't mean that if you identify with one of these things that you're immediately at risk for secondary traumatic stress. But if there are many of those on that list um, that resonate, then it is, you know, that there is an increased risk, and we have to be aware of that. There is some good news, though. The good news is that there is such thing as compassion satisfaction. This is deriving pleasure from helping others. I'm sure many of us went into the fields we're in because of this. And vicarious resilience, which is the positive transformation that we experience as a result of bearing witness to individuals who can overcome adversity. And that's even more powerful when we ourselves are part of that. And engaging in self-care and self-compassion can help reduce the cost of caring and increase personal resiliency. And when we talk about self-care, you might think about bubble baths and yoga and eating well. But what we're really talking about is the ability to engage in helping others, 
without sacrificing other important parts of our own lives. So just as we say to adults on a plane, we put our own oxygen mask on first and then help those around us, that's really what we need to be doing in in these fields where trauma and grief are so prevalent. I want to just mention that we have a virtual learning library on the TAG Center website where we have freely downloadable webinars and resources for caregivers and teachers and pediatricians and others. And we also have um, handouts for parents. We have a Power of Parenting series that helps parents to talk to kids about very difficult situations, including death due to suicide, drug overdose, um, deaths in the context of the pandemic. And if you're interested in other trainings that we're offering, if you hover over that QR code, that will put you on our listserv um, where you can, um, you'll can you learn more about other trainings that we're offering o- over the course of the year. And th- that's my contact information. Um, I think we have about five minutes um, for questions, if anyone has a question or a comment. Uh, so there was a slide. I uh, can't remember the the top the top of it, but where woman women was the first yeah. bullet. Mm-hmm. Why specifically just women? That's a very good question. So that was a, that that is derived from studies where they looked at the demographics of those who were experiencing more secondary traumatic stress and found that women in particular more than men experienced um, secondary traumatic stress for whatever reason. They actually didn't provide an explanation for that. Okay, that yeah. that was my question. Really, was behind what. What? Behind it, yeah. yeah. That's a really good question. I, to be honest with you, um, you know, in some studies, they have shown that women tend to be more forthcoming about their secondary traumatic stress and vicarious trauma. So it could just be a reporting issue, um, or you know, there are some other theories. But that you know, there really hasn't been enough research on that exact topic to really know for sure. Okay. Thank you. We have a question online. How can we get in touch with Dr. Kaplow? Although you had your your information up there, um, she is a student and would love her, your guidance on being a therapist. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to everyone. If I want, just want to remind everyone to take your survey after this presentation. That really helps us a lot. Um, but do you need to take a picture of it real quick? Okay. And then for the student who is online, I am going to. Um, put up Dr. Kaplow's uh, presentation again. Okay. Um, and go to the end here. And there is her present, there is her information if you'd like to get in touch with her. And Dr. McCarty is saying thank you, Dr. Kaplow, that this was amazing. Thank you, Dr. McCarty. So thank you, everyone, for show, for uh, uh, coming today to today's presentation. We, we hope you found it useful. And again, if you'd like to contact Dr. Kaplow, she has uh, the three different ways that you can contact her there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.